Thank you so much for coming out today. This is a very, very special panel because this is the first Latin panel that, yes, <laughs> here at Midsummer Scream and probably everywhere else. So um, let's get this party started. Um, I'm gonna bring up my co-host, which is uh, Matthew Torres, they call him the Storytime Guy. I just want to say thank you guys for coming. I'm so excited that you guys are here. This means so much to me. When she approached me with this, she's like, do you want to do this? I was like, it's not a question whether I want to do this. I need to do this. I'm so happy that you guys are here to witness this. We are going to have a great banter. We were having great banter before. And just honestly, guys, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I have a giveaway, too, at the end. So stay tuned for the end when you guys ask questions. Um, and yeah, I mean, Satanic Inspects Specs, the first Latin horror film, anthology film, and to see these directors and writers and people here go from kind of indies to keep working our way up and up and up. And the fact that, you know, we have Demi Rugna um, who worked on this movie and Mike Mendez, like for all the millennials here, Efren Ramirez from Vote for Pedro from Napoleon Dynamite. It's 20 year anniversary. I feel old. I think the movie came out when I was in middle school. Um, and yeah, just to have this panel here. Um, I will say though, I rant, I talk a lot. She's gonna reel me in when I talk too much, when all of us talk too much, because it will happen. So just be aware of that. She's gonna, she's doing her job. We asked her to do this, say, tell us to shut up. We talk too much, okay? <laughs> so, very excited. We're gonna keep it very, very real. And yeah, let's, let's do it, I'm excited. And afterwards, you can ask questions. So if you have them, have them ready. Once in a lifetime right here. First guest <laughs> coming up is a writer, director, horror comedy, one of the dead. Also worked on Nightmare Cinema with Mick Garris and Joe Dante. Also directed the recently released uh, thriller, The Inheritance. Let's welcome Alejandro Brugas. Any seat. Okay. Thank you. Next, we have uh, the director of Big Ass Spider, who wrote direct Friday the 31st and Tales of Halloween, also a really fascinating editor, yeah. Nightmare Cinema, Critters Attack, and The Shed, which I love The Shed. He was also in Malignant, and he played Gus in The Hammer of Zanzibar. Uh, he did the wraparound story, The Traveler, in Satanic Hispanic. Let's welcome Mike Madman Mendez. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> His c career consists of guest appearances, television, diverse character roles, ER, American Dad, Scrubs, Pixar, you name it, he was probably in it. We know him as Pedro from Napoleon Dynamite. Uh, he stars in an upcoming horror thriller called Seven Cemeteries. Look that story up, it's really cool. Let's welcome Efron Ramirez. <laughs> The only chair. Oh, okay. Are you wanting to sit right here? I'll, I'll yeah. fill in his okay. lamp. Uh, but the fact that we got invited here today to speak not only on this panel, but with you two, you know, and to be with all of you guys here today is, uh, wow, it's pretty cool. Okay, so we're going to get started on the questions. And like uh, Matthew said, it's very open. We're going to start it off with anything you have to say. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. you want to start off with like the hard questions of like... Just get uh, to like, it. All right, so <laughs> look, I, as a content creator, I go to red carpets, and there's a lot of times where I'm the only brown dude in the room, and it's really uncomfortable sometimes. And I've had multiple times people go, oh, that's not where you guys park uh, for the waiters park over there. I'm like, oh no, I'm literally on my way to talk to the CEO of Prime Video. I, thank you though, I appreciate that. So my question is, has there been a moment where you guys are like, I, I'm the token, but I'm gonna do my best to do what I can do with what I'm getting? Well, we have also gotten that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like <laughs> I, when, we, when we were doing our first round of interviews in our premiere, we had a, um, one interviewer made the joke, like it was the five of us, the man Gigi, who's probably gonna show up and do a big entrance at some point, Ed Sanchez, and, and he made the joke, the interviewer made the joke of uh, which one of us was gonna be his Uber driver. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, so we yeah. get that shit all the time. To be honest, yeah. <laughs> we we yeah. don't help because I mean you know, some are some are good. Like yeah. the one they where are no we longer here. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, well, yeah, but that wasn't that wasn't a good one. But yeah, the one that we, about how do we get together the rest of the directors if we just went to Home Depot? <laughs> that was that was uh, that was pretty good. That was funny. Yeah, yeah. That was yeah. Funny. <laughs> Uh, well, yes, that has been a consistent thing uh, throughout this. If uh, if we're available for landscaping, uh, and and we might be. So <laughs> yeah, actually we are. <laughs> Who ended up driving the guy that day? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but what's the question? <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's that's like I said, we've all had those experiences there where it's just like if that oh. happens, just take their car, dude, and go for a joyride, <laughs> enjoy it while you have it, right? <laughs> no, but the thing is that when that happens, we just like laugh awkwardly, and then when he leaves, we look at each other and was like, that was fucked up, right? Was yeah, that fucked up? That was kind of fucked up. Was that like not cool? Yeah, well, and we could even write a review. So I put it like, la pura verdad. Look, you could also switch it. The fact that we are here. And they're surprised, and they don't know what to do. The reality that we exist, and we're here. We're telling our stories, and we're sharing a part of what we can create, which is the positive outlook on any kind of struggle, right? Yeah. Is that we are actually making it happen. When these guys approached me about work, wanting to work on this film, I thought, wow, this is different. You know, because I normally do comedies or dramas, so... Um, when I was approached to do a horror film, I thought like, yeah, I'm into this. So <laughs> no, and yeah. I, like, I think that's the one thing too, it's like the, the, the fact that you guys with this movie were able to cover comedy and scares, like that first film scared the shit out, there's no kids, right? The first film scared the shit. Like if you guys have seen Satanic Hispanics, you know that the table scare, oh my gosh, scary. Even yesterday I was watching this game, I'm like, I know this is gonna happen, this doesn't scare the shit out of me, and it did. And, but at the same time, we have the Dracula one. We have, I mean, so for those of you that haven't seen or it's been a while, the Hammer of Zanzibar one. <laughs> uh, once again, no kids. Uh, someone beats the shit out of someone else with a demon dick. And it's the wildest. Yeah. Spoilers. Shot. Yeah. It's, yeah, spoiler. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been, been out for two years. It's been out for two years. Exactly, yeah, yeah. You know, but the fact that, like, it, like, was there a point where you were watching this, like, going, what the fuck? But, like, in a good way? <laughs> Okay, so first, I think we have established that I that Efren is the optimistic one here. So it's good that we start with me. I'm gonna be the downer, <laughs> and it ends. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what was the question again? <laughs> uh, demon dick beating. What yeah, the fuck? Yeah, I, I kept it. Way. I mean, Wait, I, can we I be really clear on the question? On what? What is it again? I, I I actually kept it. Obviously, that's that's why you do this kind of thing. And Mike has another one. You know, it's funny because when we were doing the, the movie, I was about to have my the daughter, and the Hammer of Zanzibar is 24 inches, <laughs> which was exactly how long she was when she was <laughs> born. So <laughs> I had to take a picture. I, 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 I One day I was playing with her <laughs> in my office, and I had the Hammer of Zanzibar there, and I was like, I have to take this picture. So... <laughs> I know it's gonna come back to me on the trial at some point. <laughs> it's gonna be evident. He, he was worried that he was gonna get canceled uh, by doing it. You know, he was like, "Should I do this? I, I'm, I'm worried it's not gonna go over well." And I'm like, "This is why you should do it. This is all the more reason yeah, you should I, do it." I, uh, I have gotten a ton of shit anyway. I'm like, I, I was like, Mike, I have this idea, but I don't think I think you should talk me out of it. And he was like, "No, fuck no, you have to do it." <laughs> and then and then I was like, "Okay, maybe I bring it up with the others. Maybe Gigi is gonna be the the voice of reason or something." She was like, "Fuck yeah, you have to do that." And and yeah, I ended up doing that, and I have gotten some shit. He's gotten like some shit about yeah. it, but you know, at the at the end of the day, it's like that's why we wanted to make the movie because we know that no studio is going to make that story, no television show is going to make that story. It's kind of up to us that not only do we want to tell our Latino stories, but we also want to kind of do stuff that is different and a little edgier. So for me, it was like that was exciting. That was exactly what we're looking for. So I, I'm very happy he did. Yeah, that. and and it has a lot like uh, everything. Other than the hammer, is based on 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 well, real yeah, on exactly. real ceremonies and all that stuff. These, these are these are real deities that he's talking about. The thing about not about that supposed to be secret. That was all based in reality on some real ceremonies that I saw, and I always wanted to talk about it. I just happened to find out about the Popobawa and 
Yeah, so the Popo Bow is a real myth. That yeah. uh, if, if yeah. I don't know if you want to do, do the basic, you know, thirty second pitch of what the Popo Bow is. It's exactly what it's in the, the Hammer of Zanzibar. It's a demon from Zanzibar. Well, it has it a Wikipedia page. You can look it up. <laughs> Essentially, it was way worse in the Wikipedia page because it fucks you, and then you have to say it, or if not, it keep coming back. And we were like, okay, maybe skip that part. I think there was a draft where uh, he was supposed to say it. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> Reeling us this in. This is going great. <laughs> yeah, it's, been, it's been two questions and we're already <laughs> doing the big uh, thing. Uh, Mike, you had a quote in Screen Rant that I thought was important. You said, filmmaker autonomy is super important to us. It was a matter of trusting your filmmakers and trusting that they were going to do a good job. Well, and you wanted to reflect that into the work for Satanic Hispanic. I, I would say particularly in this film, uh, we felt we had an obligation. You know, this was the first all Latino uh, horror anthology. I'm of the opinion Latinos make damn good filmmakers. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I think we have people like Guillermo del, uh, del Toro or Alfonso Coron that can back that up. Uh, and I felt that there was a wonderful pool of very talented horror filmmakers that you know I wanted to, to draw from and absolutely autonomy was one of the key things that we wanted to give everyone the chance to do it because we're, we're we want to represent we want to show a side of our culture that has never been seen before whether it be legends from certain countries that are may not be as familiar because everyone always goes to chupacabra la llorona things like that but there's you know latin america is huge there's so many different things and we absolutely wanted to not only represent our own cultures and our own, and our own heritage uh, but let filmmakers really make badass stuff to go like hey we're latino filmmakers we're we're one of the uh, as far as like people of color, like one of the least that actually are uh, above the line as far as writers, directors, and in front of the camera, and we wanted, wanted to change that. We were just like, that's not cool. LA is like 40% Latino. Uh, the amount of writer directors uh, uh, that are above the line that you know work in the film industry is 4%. It's like, that's, that's not cool, <laughs> you know? And so even if we had to do it on an independent level, we felt we should, you know, just because no one else was doing it, so. I, I would tell him like all the time, Mike, we cannot fuck this up because you know, <laughs> let's face it, there's a big chance we will. Um, but yeah, uh, we were conscious that yeah, we had to do a good job. I mean, a good job, as, as good as we can. As good as we could with no money. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because Gigi, uh, who, who, this is a quote from Screen Rat, she also said, we all know each other, but it was neat to see what it means to have the freedom to just create because we don't get it, get that enough. And I just thought that was important. That, that was kind of like one of my reasons why I was doing some research was like, you're right, like there is a majority, when I go to the movies and I sit down, I mostly see the Latino community. And I'm just like, well then on the film is like not that much. And so I'm trying to figure out like, that, but but we if we're in there. We die first. The the black people most enjoy first. So we don't last very long in the in the movie. But it's it's kind of changing. But we but would always say yes. The black guy or black person always dies first. But the Latino's not even in the movie. So <laughs> <laughs> you try to no 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 no. This is this for real. Like think yeah, about yeah, yeah, think I, about I, the horror movies we grew up with uh, and try to come up with a Latino uh, character. And it really, we yeah. do this. And I'm it pretty would, sure you're good at horror trivia. Yeah, and it's like they have a Latino think, character think from the in, movies, in a Freddy or movie or Jason or something movie like that. or any of them. And, and really, there are very, very few, you know, so anyway. And there's even less portrayed by Latino actors because there's a few yeah, Latino that's characters, that's right. like Aliens, right? The, the badass right, character. Exactly. She's not Latina. Right. She thought the Aliens was like an illegal Aliens immigrant movie. That's why she tanned her skin. I swear to God, she showed up to set with that, and they're like, oh no, xenomorph aliens, not Mexicans. <laughs> and she did a good job, so they kept her. But yeah, it's even those times, kinds of movies were just like, it's we're horrible. there. We're not true. there. I mean, she did an awesome, you know. Yeah. She, but, but yeah, it's true. But you yeah. compare it to something like Scream 5 and 6, right. where there's, there's a black brother and sister, and there's two Latino sisters, right? And so they're like, oh, previously we're going to represent that, like, Ah, they're, they're, you know, what, what the hell? We'll say they're both half white. Like, ah, that's fine, you know? And you keep moving forward and we keep getting the most characters. So, like, 
Yeah, I grew up in the, the 90s, and yeah, there was no representation for yeah. us. But we're getting there, and we're still in the 90s. was like a little this. bit better. We, we owe a lot to Jenna Ortega, yeah. apparently. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Beetlejuice Wednesday, yeah. Scream. She's doing it for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> Just carrying Great. the weight. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, but it's very small. I mean, it's happening. It's not happening fast enough. Uh, I'll tell you, like, a, a one that kind of upset me that was, like, well, actually, another one, Saw, Saw X is one that kind of upset me because yeah, <laughs> it's like, no, I'm with you on that one. there's Latino representation, but everyone is a crook, rapist, prostitute, or thief, uh, and I'm like, see, this is kind of exactly what we're talking about, about, like, you know, and, and, and the, the main villains are the white people because they're smart. Uh, <laughs> yeah, know, that was, uh, like, Mike and I were watching together. I think we were the only two on in, the thea in the theater. I'm sure. Who's Palm and, Springs? And so. we were and <laughs> at, at, at 15 minutes in, I lean and I'm like, Mike, is this a bit racist? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I just want to say, as like someone who loves Aztec mythology, they use the wrong god. They use the god of rain in there, Thalak. They have a god of sacrifice, Shipatotic. His name is the Lord of the Flayed Ones. And they didn't pick him. Right. I that's don't understand. A, that's the second that's thing I said to Mike. <laughs> <Yeah>. That's exactly <laughs> like, after that, I said that to Mike. It's like, <laughs> Uh, but another one that, that upset me, this is from two years ago, during Hispanic Heritage Month, DC Comics decided, hey, we're going to rep uh, a, a you know Latino superhero. So they had a, green a Latino Green Lantern on the cover. Cool, great, awesome. Right before publishing, I don't know whose idea it was, but somebody said, you know what they need? What he needs? A bag of tamales in his hand. Uh, and they drew in a bag of tamales, so, you know, so that people would, <laughs> would accept it. I mean, how else would you know? And, and, and yeah. <laughs> And tamales I, are delicious. I left mine on the chair before coming <laughs> up here. <laughs> and, and so that was kind of our thing, and that's why we wanted to represent like different cultures and myths instead of the Taco Bell menu. You know. <laughs> I'm hungry. I would, uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind some tamales. We should find a tamale place. Oh, no, tamales here. are good. I mean, I'm not. I'm not arguing that. <laughs> um, Efren. <laughs> I have a yeah. <laughs> so you played the traveler in the yes. film. Um, what was it about the film that you wanted to be a part of? And I also read that you gave, both of you gave a lot of freedom to the filmmakers, but did they give you, Efren, a lot of freedom for you to develop the traveler character? Um, yeah, when Mike approached me, he talked about having to do an anthology about this, uh, the horror fest, you know, of this story where the traveler, he collects relics, and within these relics, each relic has a story. And I thought that was such a great idea because not only do we enter the mysticism, but we also enter culture, right, of Latin America, either from Mexico or Central America or, or South America, which is interesting because everyone has a strong point of view in telling their specific stories with the, the history of horror and the characters that come about. Even when we talk about, you know, the Aztecs, you know, Matthew does have a lot of information on Instagram. That's like how we became friends. Because I was going, ah, I'm being more informed every day by his information on the history of the Aztecs and their mysticism, whether it, it, it was their supernatural belief or what actually occurred while they're in, in existence of just slicing people up in pieces and, and wearing them as shields. <laughs> you go, okay. But I thought it was interesting of the fact of playing a character who has lived for over 500 years to be able to tell his stories and his experiences, not only living life in Mexico, but then crossing over to the United States, even before it was United States, and having to live a life of being chased around by, this, by the demon of death, right? Um, and so when Mike and I talked about it, I said, there's a few things about him, which is one, being chased around and living a life of anxiety, wondering if you're gonna live the next day, um, uh, what these relics mean to me, if I could use them as a, uh, some kind of a shield, and then the gun. The fact be, uh, that I was given the opportunity to be able to speak upon every story in the anthology of Satanic Hispanics was, was the reason why I chose to make this film, because then people who watch this film can really experience different tales from different points of views from different directors. And uh, it, it was uh, a joy to work with Mike. 
And you learned a language for it. You, you taught yourself. You know? Yeah. yeah. The, the, I was like, um, I want to be able to, I go, Mike, uh, I want to be able to talk to one of the, one of the cops in French. And I want to be able to speak in Nahual. And I mean, if I've lived for so long, why wouldn't I be able to speak different languages? So, There's always like the, the pass you make in the screenplay, what you do on, on set and, and the edit. I always think of it as three different passes on the screenplay, but, but Everett did a, an entire kind of pass himself where he, he added, you know, different languages and phrases that were true to, you know, uh, the Aztec language and, and it was incredible, you know, and, and most, I mean, I think pretty much we kept all of it, you know, he was like, hey, can I try this and can I, you know, uh, you know, what if I throw this term in or whatever and it was awesome. I mean, but the, the reason that, you know, he cemented the role without question uh, is uh, I, got a, I got a call one day from the traveler. Uh, he had, we had sent him the script, uh, but I got a, a message on my phone uh, from the traveler uh, with, with this cool music uh, kind of letting me know that he was the traveler or that he was coming, and I was like, dude, this guy is into it. He's, he's got it. You know? <laughs> Vote for Pedro, motherfucker. He's doing it. <laughs> um, the practical effects were outstanding. Do you think if the film industry would give more freedom to filmmakers that we'll see more practical effects instead of just stepping in and putting a little bit more? Because I noticed in this one, it was just, it, it, was, I, I, it, it was like this nostalgic feeling like, I miss this stuff, and especially that under the table scene with Damien's, I screamed and hollered, and it was still coming at him with the fingers broken and everything, and each one was just amazing, but you gave that freedom. Do you think it, it would change from your experience? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's a, a matter of freedom, because I mean, I think you can always make a good case. Uh, most of you can try to make a good case about going practical in every project. I think the new Alien is practical, so I don't know. You can. I, th I think you still can do that. The thing is that, I mean, obviously practical is uh, better, and we all love practical, but it's also trickier. Like you usually need a budget, you need uh, time, and you need to know how to do it, so it doesn't suck. But so. Um, I think it might make executives a bit nervous, but you can always make a point about it. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's a freedom thing. Well, what was cool about it was that it wasn't anything we ever discussed. It wasn't a thing of like, you gotta use practical effects. It, it was just solely that we picked filmmakers that had similar sensibilities to us that just that's what they wanted to do because they knew it was better. You know, they knew like, we grew up with the thing, we grew up with the fly, you know, we, we have, you know, uh, you know, whether it be Rick Baker or, uh, you know, Rob Bottin kind of going through our veins and in our minds. So it wasn't something that we all agreed on. Like, the only thing we said is, like, it all has, the aspect ratio has to be 2, 3, 5, so it's a uniformity. But we, we uh, that, that was, like, I said, let them do whatever they want, and he, uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm the bastard that. who pushed that. But anyway, <laughs> but as far as uh, effects, it was kind of like, do, do what you want. And, it, and I, just, I think we just sort of knew that most likely they wouldn't go digital, because we probably couldn't afford it anyway. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> it, you know, uh, but at the same time, I think everyone just loves practical effects. I know I certainly do, Alejandro does. Yeah, we want to keep the props. <laughs> yeah, like well, the, that's the, true. The, the, man, the man keeps his props. He had the, the kid from Terrified in his living room uh, <laughs> when he left home so no one would rob his house. And, I, and the other day we were talking to him and, and he, was, uh, he had the guy from uh, When Even Lurks uh, sitting behind him. So, yeah, that's why you do that kind of stuff. Mike has uh, San La Muerte. Um, so I have the hammer of Zanzibar. It in front of my bed. It is a thing, and, <laughs> and you know, I think at a, at a Halloween convention like that, we probably can get it. That we love props and we love masks and we love toys. So if there's anything that we can keep, all for it. So that that's the extra bonus of going practical too. Is that yes, San Lamuerte is in my office. He's got the hammer. Yeah, Zanzibar. we were we were talking about that like when we were walking the floor uh, earlier. We were like, it would be nice to have some satanic Hispanic uh, things like have San Lamuerte sell. Smaller hammer of Zanzibars. <laughs> I, I, I think those could be a hit. And also a, a big shout out that we have an incredibly talented, at least for ours, uh, I mean everyone was talented that worked on it, but you know, incredibly talented uh, makeup artist uh, oh, yeah. named Norman Cabrera, who's a, yeah. a Cuban uh, artist who's created the Angel of Death for Hellboy 2 for Guillermo del Toro and is just amazing 
and we're very lucky to have him. And, and he was he was actually the one that kind of coined the term Satanic Hispanics, uh, at least for us. I think there's been like DJs and other other versions, but we used to, as a side thing, we used to kind of like make heavy metal videos on, on weekends. Uh, and, uh, you know, the DP was Hispanic, Norman was was uh, Latino, as, as was I. And so he just said, yeah, we're the Satanic Hispanics, you know, and, and that just kind of stuck and that's how it kind of became a movie. So when you received the completed works, did you, use that to create the wraparound story or was it already there and then you just no it was tricky we actually shot the wraparound first uh oh. so yeah it, i just kind of you know and had to kind of pressure everybody of like even the screenplay yeah yeah we wrote that first and and we had to kind of pressure everybody can you just tell us what it's about so yeah. we can <laughs> kind of sort of because yeah. you know sometimes the intros are a little eh, you know as far as like it's not exactly describing what happens, but it's close enough, or at least it's vague enough that, that we can kind of buy it. So there was a couple things we would do that we would ask the filmmaker to either base it on like an object so that it's a like an object uh, he can have in his bag. So Put, in put in some object there, yeah. Some. Yeah, so in Gigi's case, uh, there was a vial of blood and so uh, we had a vial of blood on our end, and she put a vial of blood on her end, and, and they're not the same size if you look at the movie, but whatever. Uh, you know, <laughs> we're, do, we're doing our best, you know? Uh, and so, so yeah, it that's was... not the right blood. Right, exactly. <laughs> that's yeah. an A positive, come on. What kind of movie <laughs> is this? Uh, and so, uh, anyway, so we would kind of base it on either that or a character, like, you know, uh, Demian's was like a photo, like, oh, I yeah, know no, that guy. Yeah, but even, even writing, we were like, Demian, do you know what yours is about? Or Ed, because the wraparound was written before yeah. everything else, so we were like, um, Ed, what's yours about? I think I'm gonna do something about vampires. Okay, good. And, and for like Demian, like he had given us a rough outline, and then then he wrote the script and he had changed the character's name, and it was like, no, no, use use Gus because that's what we shot, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he's got to be called Gus. So did you, Efren, did you use that information to help create um, the character? Um, the Traveler, along with what you did your research for? Well, you know, you do your research and you, f you start doing the work with what we have, which is a Traveler. And then when we're entering the ghost stories, that's when I start to take a look at the, the folklore. Um, and then the histories of vampires, like there's vampires in Mexico? So, um, but to really explore then and go, all right. I didn't know how dark it would be, but based upon with what's created, I understood that it was supposed to be um, something really creepy, you know? Uh, and I, I even asked Mike, like, what, where are we going with these stories? And he was like, okay, this one's about a witch, and then, of course, with, with Gus, it's very the, the paranormal, and these are different worlds that we don't even know much about that we have yet to explore. So I thought, even in the life of the traveler, there are certain things that he does not understand and that I played true to whatever that moment was. And, and, and I also got to say, even as I played throughout the history with my character, it was so great to be able to work with, you know, Sonia, of course, and, and with, you know, Lombardo Boyard and, and Greg Grunberg, because these are great actors who I was able to bounce off and play. There was a moment where we were doing a scene and, and something happened <laughs> between Greg and me, and we just got into it. Uh, is it the fuck you scene? Yeah. Well, fuck <laughs> you, yeah, no, fuck you, no, yeah. fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then when Mike goes, cut, I went, dude, you're right? He's like, yeah, you're good? Yeah, we're good. And Mike goes like, I don't know what you guys did, but um, can you guys do it again? <laughs> did you cut that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> so. Okay. The Hammer of Zanzibar. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You so ahead, the Popobawa is an African, it. it's a West African folklore lore story of a, pretty much, it's not a demon because they didn't have demons, but it's, it's a monster. And it flies in and it has its way. There with she oh, is. Gigi oh, Guerrero, hey. ladies and gentlemen. Make it a yeah, great yeah, entrance, Gigi yes. Guerrero. <laughs> we need another chair up on stage. Yeah. We didn't even know she was in town until she just walked in the door. <laughs> yeah, we're talking Popo about Bawa, the Hammer of Zanzibar. You came in at a good time. <laughs> um, <laughs> hi, I'm Gigi. Nice to meet you guys. Mucho gusto. I was the director and writer, um, co-writer of uh, Nahuales, which was the one that took place in Catemaco, Veracruz, which is the birthplace of witchcraft. So I'm the responsible one for the, uh, the indigenous horror tale where the faces rip off and but wait, gets pretty nasty. Gee, yeah. when you walked in, we were talking dick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
we were we were talking about uh, the like hammer. Like I said, I came no, just we, on time. We were time. talking no, about no, the no. yeah, I know that that was a perfect entrance. We were talking about the hammer of Zanzibar and the Popovawa one. So don't you storm in like you, as if you were looking for the Popovawa. <laughs> yeah, so the Popovawa African folktale monster. Uh, and my favorite bit of real life history that this is like this happened recently is a bunch of guys were scared this was happening. So what they did was nine guys got together, they got butt naked in a room, and they oiled themselves up. So if the Popobawa tried to get them, it couldn't grab onto them because they were all oiled up and naked. And I'm like, that, those are gay men. Those are gay men having a, that's, that's not, the, otherwise yeah. they're like, that makes sense. Uh, I, he, that's why like he goes time. on Friday nights. You I, know? I smell sequel. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, Mike, Mike wasn't happy when, when I was working on this because I was sending him pictures for reference yeah. all the time. <laughs> And he didn't know what was going to show up uh, on the phone when... when don't when Google demon dick. That's, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> don't don't um, do it. African demon dick. Yeah. And just and so, jumping up real quick. So to introduce you more. So you've done indigenous. You're probably one of the few Latino filmmakers that constantly brings indigenous horror to the main screen. You were in the recent VHS. Um, and you also did one of your first short films, right? Was the that fight scene in the woods, right? There was the indigenous oh, god... Yeah, so if you want to talk about that real quick and just kind of talk about how folklore and how these things are kind of affecting you and how you're bringing this all to the, the forefront. I mean, I haven't really done anything Popobawa-esque, <laughs> but uh, I'll leave that for Alejandro. Um, yeah, no, I mean, coming from Mexico City and then moving to Canada, it only felt right to stay close to your roots and use film in a way to <gasps> express anything you have that is your background and your folklore. And living in Canada, being the only Latino there, not only am I freezing all the time, but um, <laughs> definitely was a really good way for me to just find a, a happy place. Uh, in Canada, there is all the cultures in the world and not a lot of Latinos except for my house. And so <laughs> it was a perfect way to discover film. And so through all the short films I've done and the features I've done, uh, it's been the best way to actually bring more of that Mexicanismo, as we say, chingonismo, as we say, <laughs> into screen. Um, and then the, the VHS 85 I directed, it only felt right to do um, based on the earthquake of 85, based in Mexico, but I did not know it was a little too soon. And I was going to get a lot of uh, hate online that it was too soon to talk about the earthquake. But sometimes I think genre is the best escapism we have. So we can Let's talk wait, about 85 that. 1985 was too soon? <laughs> like I, that's what I thought, too. But um, it must have been too traumatizing for Mexico City Shit, people. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, there was an article, as soon as that, that anthology came out, there was an article that came out, and it said, the filmmaker responsible for bringing back our nightmares, Gigi Saul Guerrero. And I'm like, yeah. Oh, wait, that's not a good one. That's not a good one. <laughs> I was like, wait, wait, that's, not, that's, that's different press. But, I mean, still good. But, it, yeah, I mean, sometimes maybe it is too soon. Fuck it. I, c I haven't been able to stop thinking about those nine oiled guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to have to write them. I was curious, if, how did you get Jonah? <laughs> <laughs> Wait. I, I just, just like, so moving forward. I, I know, no, 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 no. Yeah, but like, I, I, Gigi is talking, and I'm thinking, and I'm thinking how the scene plays. No, this is like, yeah, yeah, it's like, like our I writing, have an idea. This yeah. is like our writing sessions. He, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, it's, it's he exactly says something, that. and then I go, so anyway. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. <laughs> it's something like that. Moving I can, on. I can imagine the, the character of like coming up, like, I have a plan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. You were saying. <laughs> <laughs> you, were talking, you were talking about Jonah Ray. Yeah, I'm, Jonah Ray. I'm pretty sure he's going to love getting the call saying, Jonah, it's going to be you and eight other guys. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I noticed about The Hammer of Zanzibar, it reminded me. Oh, <laughs> it re well, I wanted to say it because it reminded me of Evil Dead. Oh, like yeah. it had that element in there. Was, okay. Okay. I actually pitched that to to Raimi because I wanted to do a, like an Evil Dead spin-off. Uh, I wanted to do the the Cuban cousin of the Kandarian demon, and I pitched the idea of making this around this ceremony and all the stuff that happened. And he loved the idea, but they were making uh, Evil Dead Rise uh, back then. I didn't know that, but they were starting to work on that, so they passed on it. And and. 
we never talked about it again, and now apparently everyone is doing an Evil Dead spin-off. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, it had that influence, and everything, and I wanted to do like a weird structure. I wanted to, mm, like non-linear thing, I do all the chapters. The Hammer of Zanzibar was gonna be one chapter, because it was sort of like Kill Bill, you have to go get the weapon. It was the Hattori hands of, of Demon Dicks. <laughs> Uh, there was another chapter, what happened in Havana, and you know that kind of, of thing. So yeah, th there's a lot of there's a lot of Raimi and Tarantino. In there. Do you want to talk about what? Oh, sorry, what, what inspired it? Not not the Popobawa, but uh, the, the the ceremony you attended. Well, no, it was an actual ceremony. Uh, it was the first job I did on film. I was a camera assistant, and it was late '90s in Cuba, and there was this Spanish documentary uh, doing uh, Santeria ceremonies and Palo and all that, and and I saw this one. Uh, and it was like really creepy and uh, there was this really old woman I was carrying a bunch of cables and there was this really old woman and she said to me are you from this religion and I said no she was like then you cannot look at this and I was like carrying cables and looking <laughs> because you know yeah, just in case and then um, and they weren't supposed to be shooting but the director talked to the cameraman and they had the code so some of the staff when the person was doing the ceremony said don't shoot this they would put the camera on the side but still be shooting and I was like oh fuck this is gonna it's not gonna go well, <laughs> and and then and then at the end they brought a goat. They got the head of the goat. They poured the blood over an altar. Then they grabbed the hair, the head. They put rum on the severed neck and started drinking from it and passing it around. And that's uh, the first time I walked out of a set. The last time, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, if they pass that shit to us, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bailing. Um, but yeah, but then, yeah, and this was probably 98, uh, and it stayed with me all this time. What would happen if those things that you're not supposed to, to show actually get out? And, and obviously that's why it was John, it, was, it had to be the white guy um, screwing up all the, the stuff. Uh, but yeah, it, it stayed with me all this time. And I don't know, maybe one day I get to do the, the, the Caribbean Evil Dead. <laughs> one, one thing I, I like about the movie is that I learned from it because I did not know any of these folklores or stories. So as I'm watching it, I was like looking it up. I was like you're, Googling. You're booking your flight to, to <laughs> Zanzibar. <laughs> it's $670. I've already looked it up in case you... <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> so, so yeah, it was it was definitely a learning experience to to see, and, and I just loved everybody in it. So it was just wonderful to go through that. To s yes. So, um, will there be a number two? Uh, no. <laughs> what? Yeah. Here's here's the bummer, and and again, I I hate to be the bearer of bad really news. Go back to one of the first questions. So go it's ahead. Like, well, it's like I, I I wish I would like nothing more, especially uh, honestly, as I sit here with uh, with everyone, I'm kind of like I'm kind of missing being on set, and I'm like, man, because I'm hearing the traveler coming out of you, and I'm like, God, I wish we could do more. But uh, it it the God's honest truth, it it has not done that well. It has done very well. Um, critically and it's done very well w with fans but we could hardly sell territories it was a huge struggle to get it you know for any streamer to buy it took a, a year or something like that for someone to buy it and uh, after the theatrical you know run which did you know I mean I think it kind of broke even and that's being somewhat kind uh, you know the first thing um, Epic Picture said to us is like yeah there's no sequel uh, <laughs> so it was kind of like that's a bummer but but I don't want to be all doom and gloom. Uh, we're still very committed to, to the cause, and we would like to kind of make feature versions of perhaps some of the stories or work with some of the filmmakers uh, to make features uh, that we would produce and kind of collaborate and kind of make, you know, a series. They won't necessarily be satanic Hispanics, but you'll know, uh, you know, uh, of, of perhaps working with some of the other filmmakers and kind of expanding that. So it, it's not going to die completely. We're still, we still want to do stuff and we still want to, you know, kind of push the the Latino, you know, representation agenda, and we will, that that's kind of a given no matter what and whatever we do, just in casting and things like that. I think the 
there's always going to be a certain element. But uh, but yeah, sadly, there will be no Satanic Hispanics too. For now. For, for now. For now. Because when you think about I think, it, I think part, what, part of because when you think about it, the more time passes, the more people see our film, right. and the more you continue to challenge audiences, the more the word spreads out. Like even we're talking about this now. How long after a year and a half, two yeah. years, and we continue to talk about it. Like, well, that's how I found out about this panel. I, I saw your Instagram post. I'm like, I'm supposed to be where? <laughs> <laughs> um, but <laughs> I'm coming. Um, so I think the more we continue to do that, satanic Hispanics too might come, oh like boy. maybe years later. I think yeah. becoming a cult classic is always a great thing. And who, who would have thought also such a risque title to be out there, like, a general audience is like, oh, I only want to see Yorona 3 that takes place in the <laughs> States, you know? Like, but you put something like Satanic Hispanics, I know a lot of our parents were like, I que pedo, way, like, yeah, I thought, like, I love, like, I'm sure, right? So, it's a rhyme. I, That's why someone's was like, no, it's not Satanic, it's a rhyme that Satanic exactly. Hispanics. Exactly. Well, we have, we have people. Rhyme. So I think we just have to keep pushing oh, that, yeah. the, the push for change and yeah. the push for for something different. So, so oh. 60 year old Everin is going to be uh, the traveler. <laughs> going to be, uh, you no, know, I haven't aged a day you know, in uh, 200 years. <laughs> one, one thing I did Death want to say, is go, going, going back to the original questions, I think one issue that we have with uh, Latinos, and I'm pretty sure they will agree, is that we go to see movies, we just don't go to see our movies. So it's like, how do we get the Latino audience to actually support uh, the Latino films? And it's not just our films. We can point to stuff like, like Blue Beetle and stuff like that, that it took like like 58 superhero movies before someone said, we should do a Latino one, you know, uh, and, and nobody went to see it <laughs> when they finally I mean, did. Yeah. Uh, and, and then also even Marvel, you know, they, they had also however many they did, and then finally in like Wakanda Forever, they had a Latino villain, uh, you know, Namor, who was supposed to spin off into the, I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, so it's even on that front, it, it's kind of, it's a little frustrating that it's like, okay, when, when even Hollywood does make a Latino movies, it doesn't particularly do well. And yet, um, you know, Latinos were, were, I think, like 30% of the audience for A Quiet Place 3 and, and uh, you know, Night Swim and stuff like that. So I think Hollywood's like, we don't need to make movies for them. They'll come to ours anyway. Yeah, so, you it, know, and that's annoying. a bummer. I, it's, uh, we culturally didn't, didn't, uh, we didn't, we, we didn't create a culture of going to our own movies like other uh, minorities communities so we have to work on that I, I, I just want to say a few things so first off uh, I was blacklisted by Marvel Studios for talking a lot of shit especially videos that went very viral oh, wow. and I had someone who worked there and was like they're passing it around Matt's not you're, you're fucked uh, <laughs> correct I was I got no more invites no at no nothing they kicked me to the curb but it's been 40 something movies still no Latino superhero on Marvel side I've pushed to the side, maybe I was like, look, it's, it's what it is. If you guys want to do it, you're going to do it eventually. And for the next five years, we got nothing. But maybe after that, you know. Um, as for DC and Blue Beetle, I know we all bring up, like, it didn't make that much money. But Counterpoint happened during the strikes. So that means no one could advertise for it. I didn't even go to the red carpet or the blue carpet for it out of solidarity. I did get to have dinner with Sholo Maridueña the night before. I got to meet his family. That was very nice. Because he's like, hey, I'm not going. Do you want to go get dinner? Because at the end of the day, yes, Blue Beetle didn't do good, right? But it is Blue Beetle was never in another movie. It was not. They didn't Black Panther him with Civil War. They did nothing. They said, here is a brand new character with a big budget during a strike. And even with all that against it, it only made $100 million less than The Flash with Michael Keaton. So I'll argue, yeah, Blue Beetle didn't do good, but the Marvels didn't do good. Right. No, no, Flash no, no. Didn't everything. But that's, but that's another thing. We yeah. we got to the Latino superhero whenever we, when uh, everyone's tired of uh, yeah, superhero when it was movies. Over, when the way yeah. it was over, yeah, though, I was like, like, all right, now we'll yeah. give you one. You know. uh, and they I are keeping know. him. They are keeping Cholomani Duenas. Yeah, no, 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 no. So I agree. I think a lot of things good uh, ca uh, good things came uh, from it, but I don't think we showed up in the numbers that Agreed. we should. Absolutely agree. And it's something that I, man, as like I make videos all the time, and I get. Blacks, white, Asians, everyone saying like, yeah, Latinos. And my biggest critics, well, I'm Mexican and I don't care. Then shut up. What, 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 like, what are you? No, no, what, no. It's, it's a difference it's between being Latino and being proud to be Latino. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, you got to be proud of your people. And it's something that like, I always look to the, the, to the, the black audience of going, look where they go. Look what they're doing. Zoot Suits, they created that. We copied it. 
but we started the Zutu riots, right? Like, it's always this thing. So I look to the black community and go, you know, way back when they said, we're not going to play maids anymore. And that was back in the 40s and 50s. They said, we're tired of beating the mammies. We're not doing it no more. So the Hollywood went, all right, we're going to kill all the, the, all the roles. No more maids, period. You guys are lost for jobs. And they said, sucks. It's what we're going to do. And now, back in the, the 2010s, we have a lot of Latino actors going, I don't really want to play the maids anymore. I don't want to play the housekeepers anymore. And they go, okay, we're just, not gonna, we're just gonna kill those roles outright. So we're taking the steps and it's, it's one of those things of it's gonna take time and it sucks, especially for me, like I get invited to movies when there's a Latino actor in them. And even then, even when there is a Latino actor in them, sometimes I don't get those invites. And I'm like, what do I need to do? I got people oh, with like, I got 120,000 followers on Instagram, 300 on TikTok, and I'll see someone with like 10K followers and they get invited. I'm like, damn, what, what the fuck am I doing wrong? But it's what it is. It's what it is, and we're moving up. And so, like, it is disheartening, but to know that, like, we're pushing past it, like, with VHS. That's the first, how many VHS movies have there been? That's the first time we got a Latino director in it, you know? Like, getting this movie. How many horror movies have there been? And we are the first, you guys are the first Latino anthology film? Like, then the fact that he killed this role, man, and there wasn't enough attention to him for the fact that, like, everyone's vote for Pedro, but you absolutely slayed this role. You, I didn't know you could be a serious actor. When I saw you, I was like, oh, he's going to be telling jokes and do all this shit. <laughs> dude slayed it. I was like, I'm fucking wrong, man. Like, this dude absolutely make me shut up because to see you, like, I always look at you and the worst you've done with Crank, like, we were talking about the, like, I love Crank 1 and 2, and you play a, a, a gay prostitute in that, and I'm like, that's, that's like, vote for Pedro. But then you play this role, you played it so damn seriously, you took it so damn real, I'm like, that's, that's what I love, that when we, sh when we have to show up, we show the fuck up. I want to um, end on this. Um, I have to say, anything is possible. We just, we just got to keep going because, I want to say that, because I interviewed Damian Rugna and Eduardo Sanchez about the film, and I wanted to meet them. And I, it wasn't going to happen, and then I put this together, and I'm sitting up here with them. And, and, and this, I'm so honored. I really am. Thank you. Thank people. you for doing it. <laughs> and um, so anything is possible. We just got to keep working at it. And any last things you want to say? No, I just want to say thank you to you. Um, to me, it's like I said, all this black brown unity, it's, it's so close to my heart. Um, like, so I was part of McDonald's's first Spotlight Dorado, their first major film festival. They're the first big billion dollar franchise to do a Latino film festival. First one was great. Second one, we're not talking about that one. The first one was great. They paid a lot of money. They brought Latinos in and everything. And when they're talking in this room full of all these filmmakers and Latinos everywhere, who gets on stage to say this was their idea? It's a black woman. She said, I am an executive at McDonald's. And I knew when we had to do something, we look at the money, we look at the market and go, Latinos need this. You know? And I've talked to people that are very close to Ryan Coogler. And it was his idea to go, Latinos need name more. They need this. And he was fought against that. And I'll tell you that. There's a lot of things to argue about Ryan Coogler and how he loves Latinos, but you look at the Creed franchise, you look at what he's doing, he's always, so there's this black brown unity that I wanna say like, with me and you, you know, it's for you to approach me with this, after you watch Satanic Hispanics, you were like, what the fuck are all these monsters? What's a Nawali, like what's, you know? <laughs> so to me, I'm like, that's what I love this, that we were able to get this on stage with help from you guys, so. Yeah, uh, thank you to you. Thank you to everyone on stage. I'm very excited that we all got this. Thank you to everyone who showed up. That's yeah, amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. And we're going to open it up for any questions. Anybody have any questions? Hello. So I have a bit of like a personal question okay. um, because uh, just kind of going back off of what you said with Epic saying that there will be no number two, but I'm just curious about like your journey, maybe approaching other studios or anything like that, or and even like coming off of, it's like a hard thing because I know you said it, it didn't do well, but I'm just curious about like each of yours individual journey after like it coming out and just like kind of having this like, hey, this is what we can do. Like, right. how's that been? Like, yeah. Well, I mean, it, again, it's been it's been such a mixed uh, thing. It's mostly been positive because we, you know, we we won best director at Fantastic Fest. We got just not got nominated for a Chainsaw Award for best wide with wide the, with film. real movies. With real movies, we're against uh, Godzilla minus one. We're against Megan. We're yeah. against you know, like literally all the best horror movies. Uh, I, it was it was the only thing that was a bummer. Was like okay, we're by far the smallest one, and we're the only ones that didn't get other jobs after it. <laughs> so oh yeah. A, so that was a, a bit of a bummer. So uh, I can't uh, again. We we've gotten no on Satanic Hispanics too, and we've been trying very hard. To set up our, our next one it has not gone well uh, so <laughs> it is uh, it, 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 but it's not doesn't mean that we're 
not trying or not stopping, you know, yeah. we'll, we'll get something oh, out yeah. there, but things are, are slow out there, so. Mike and I, I mean, we, we, we have uh, kept working together after Satanic Hispanics because we cannot get rid uh, of each other. We're like? We're like what? <laughs> <laughs> So that's, that's smooth. I just yeah. don't don't finish your sentences. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. They're, uh, they're like yeah. Like I, cannot, I, cannot, I cannot get rid of him. He's like herpes. Oh. Um, <laughs> but so have we, we we kept working together. I gave you the chance to say. Oh, okay. I gave you the chance Sorry, to make me herpes up. this yeah. time. <laughs> now it's you, you're, um, and yeah, we. I mean, there's a big struggle when we are both working together because clearly we are a couple of idiots and um, it's like we try to write serious stuff and somehow we end up uh, going back to the nine oil guys. Um, I wonder where that comes from though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which side of us uh, goes uh, uh, But yeah, no, we're, we, have, we have, at least we have uh, two things three things that we're working on uh, and uh, we're already talking about another one. So yeah, we're going to have a bunch of projects and we're going to try to uh, make them happen somehow. And, and genuinely want to continue to work with the directors that we've worked with and hopefully do other things, you know. So it, that's so that's why I say it's like a, the Satanic Hispanics may be gone or, or finished for now. And and the reason we can't go elsewhere is that Epic owns it. So I so mean, I guess there. if someone else was into it, uh, there's a way, but so far no one has come with a checkbook saying yeah. I really want Satanic Hispanics too. Nine old guys. Right. <laughs> That'll change it. Uh, yeah, if we another company says, hey, frantic Hispanics or something like that, <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll go, yeah, yeah, that, we're doing that now. But yeah, so we'll try to do more feature stuff. So. Angelic Hispanic? There you <laughs> go. Any, also, thank you for asking a question. I have two more of these. I don't, they're not endless. His wife made them, yes, so handmade. Yes, my wife made. them. Shout out to I'm my wife. Wow, well, this is wild. Uh, my name is Anika. Nice to meet you. Um, I was so fortunate to actually be able to see Satanic Hispanics in Scottsdale in the film festival because I'm currently right now a third year PhD student and I heard about y'all and I was like, I have to go. So I literally took like everyone from my cohort and my professors and we all went and we were like all Latinos and we like it ended and we all looked at each other and we were like, holy shit. Thank you. That's this awesome. This is amazing. <laughs> really um, appreciate so that. I just, I just really want to thank y'all because I literally, that's what my focus is on, is Latinidad and horror and monstrosity. And now y'all gave me the perfect video to literally bring into the classrooms at ASU and say, hey, look, this is where Latinos belong. We belong in horror. Look at this beautiful blend of humor and horror and scare and everything like that. So I just genuinely want to thank you all for the opportunity that y'all have given me to literally bring Latinidad and horror together in my classroom and talk about the future I generations. I the hammer of Zanzibar to a classroom. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're in college, so I do warn them. Okay. I do warn them, they're fine. They, they, they're down for that. Well, well you rock, but thank you so much. <laughs> thank that you. means the world is really nice. Um, but yeah. I was really wondering, cause like everything that y'all like know today, I can't imagine what y'all have gone through. Um, so I just, that's my question. What is y'all's words of wisdom for the future in this room and beyond. Don't wait for permission. Just do it. Don't, you know, no one's going to like come to your and say, oh yeah, we need this. It's like, you just have to go and do it, you know, because again, there, this movie wouldn't exist if we just didn't say, hey, nobody's done it. Let's do it, you know, and, and that's why it exists, so. I would say you have to, you have to keep pushing because you're going to get a lot of no's with the Latino stuff. I have a couple of projects and I've had already, I, they are a bit stuck and I've had already people say, does it have to be Latino? I'm like, yeah, it has to be Latino. Like I'm not ready to let that go yet. So you're going to get a lot of that and you're going to have to keep pushing. I'm just like, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, y yeah, I couldn't agree more. And even like, look, being a, a female and a minority in the industry is 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 pretty tough out there but even so the the two things I'd have to say is if I bring those cards those wild cards of being minority being the youngest as well there's ageism and I bring maybe I open the door to sexism or whatever I would never approach any job that I'm up for as a complaint or as an excuse or any kind of energy to let in of poor me, of I have it bad, brackets, because we already do, so why do that, right? <laughs> so if I'm already bringing that energy in, uh, that's already the, the wrong uh, step forward. You're going backwards. 
Something my grandma would always say is, never look at any of the cards you have available that makes you you and makes you unique as a negative. Use it as fuel, as the biggest advantage you have, as the biggest advantage that makes you different. So I go in the room, I am the youngest one. I don't need Botox, <laughs> you know? I go in the room and I'm the maybe the best dressed one out of everyone in that production meeting. And I've been there where, pardon? I said not if your friends are. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, and so I've been in that situation many times, even when I, when I directed um, uh, a season of The Purge. I had a rough time because nobody wanted me to tell them what to do. But I didn't want that to stop me whatsoever. And so approaching it just with, I have advantageous assets to me, which makes me the one that stands out of all that pool of people, that's what I'm gonna lean on. Uh, and then the second thing I have to say is, never be afraid of failure is the biggest lesson for sure in this business and finish what you start. A lot of people get discouraged halfway through and the trolls on, on YouTube are like, no mames, they're fucking mean. <laughs> it makes you wanna give up. Uh, and all the execs, uh, and I've been told before that uh, I'm never gonna be a filmmaker by an exec. Uh, and I it, never ever be afraid of failure. Uh, Cause like they said, it, it all kind of trickles in together. You have to push really, really hard, really hard. And, and it's worth it, it's so worth it. Damn, it's so worth it when it works out. Um, yeah, that's what I'd have to say. Um, okay, so I'm wondering, obviously now you can go viral for many things. Like you said, there's cult classics. Obviously you're known as Pedro. Does that bother you? Does it bother you that everyone's like Pedro and they're not necessarily looking at your other stuff? Um, no. It, it, <sighs> What, what you don't want to do is you, you don't want to play the villain in a film because then if the film becomes very popular, people will hate you. <laughs> so, and I just so happen to play a character that leads with hope. Remember, when, at the time for me, 20, 20 years ago, 20 years ago when I was approached um, uh, uh, to have these auditions, one for Napoleon Dynamite, the other one for the, the Alamo, um, I was going to be a Mexican soldier in the Alamo and out of, I don't know, 300. But when I read Napoleon Dynamite, I just saw this character who, who took a risk, who took a chance. And even though he was alone, he found a friendship with his friend Napoleon. And in that friendship, they helped each other's dreams come true. And I thought, wow, there's somebody who leads with hope. He's his own kind of leader and he's exploring something that he doesn't know. We talk about failures and, you know, Carla, who's my business manager and my best friend, we go through failures all the time. You know, we go through auditions and testing and we're like, okay, again, <laughs> just trying to explore different characters. For me, if I'm able to do two films a year, then I've succeeded out of, I don't know, what, 20, 40, 50, 100 auditions, right? All you need is that, as Gigi says, is that one job, once you get that, is to do the best you can. Whether it's through comedy or drama or horror, right? My job as an artist to really, is to really explore that world through those characters' points of views and be honest with it. So, and then the rest is up to you guys, because you guys are the other half, the audience, to be able to watch a film and say, yeah, you know, after watching a movie in 10 minutes, you either say, I'm into this, or what is this about? You may have said that with Satanic Panic, what is this about, but I'm into it. So, <laughs> I yeah. love that you're yeah. known for Pedro. People stop me for being Dr. Garcia on the Crest commercials. So I think <laughs> Pedro is so much fucking cooler than a fake ass dentist on your TV. <laughs> so. <laughs> so it's all good. You know, for me, if I could uh, uh, represent the culture and being Latino, being growing up here in East LA, like I was telling everyone, they have cousins here who live in Long Beach. That's that's. If I could express my own stories within storytelling and making films, then I've accomplished what I want to do already. So yeah. So thank you everyone for coming out. Thank you, Matthew, for joining me on there. Thank you so much. Because it was definitely hard to get this one.
but it's here, and we want to keep it going. So thank you. Woo! Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you thank all you. for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. And if you want to see more videos like this, hit like and subscribe button and enjoy my other videos on my channel.